Good morning, everyone, and welcome to um, uh, our high-level forum as part of the Government Aftershock uh, series. Um, this session is about the future of public employment. And I realise as I say good morning that it's good morning for me, but of course not good morning for everyone. So rather than good morning, hello. After a jam-packed day yesterday with 65 local conversations around the world, we're thrilled um, to convene this global dialogue on the crisis and what has been revealed about the role and expectations of government both now and in the future. And as the title suggests, um, a favourite sub subject of mine, and in my view, one of the most important things about all of that is our people. So our discussion today will focus on um, the future of public employment. Um, uh, I think it's been billed in advance, but I'm Simon Clayton. I'm your moderator for today. Um, when I'm not getting up early to moderate one of these sessions, um, I'm the um, HR director for um, Policy Inclusion Reward in the UK's tax authority, HMRC. Um, I also spend some time working with colleagues in OECD um, as the chair of the uh, Public Employment and Management Working Group. Um, and PEM itself is really happy to contribute, be contributing to this. And I hope that we've got many PEM, dialogue, uh, PEM uh, de delegates uh, joining us uh, today. Each of the ha sessions happening today will contribute to the development of a call for action for governments and all of us that will be developed by the OECD. We encourage you to get involved in this session using the modules on the right hand side of your screen. The discussion module is a space to share any comments, insights you have in relation to the panel. Please ask your questions, though, in the questions module. You can also um, tick or upvote on people's questions using the thumbs up uh, button on the question. And that will help to make sure that we try to address those questions um, in the Q&A that are most popular. And if you'd like to tweet as we go along, please use the hashtag um, um, government aftershock, gov aftershock. We want to start by launching a poll, which we'll, um, we'll talk about a little bit later in the session. Um, and the poll will be launched in the module on the right hand side of your screen. Um, please do take some time to share your thoughts in the response to the poll question. I'm going to read that question to get us kicked off. Um, uh, and that will give you some time to try and find that in your systems. There will, um, so I'll, I'll just start with that poll question. And that's, in your opinion, which of the following medi medium term impacts will the coronavirus crisis have on public employment? A more agile and resilient model of public sector employment? A more digitally savvy public sector workforce? new rounds of austerity, workforce reductions, pay cuts and or reduced employment security, it will have little impact. Things will eventually return to the way they are. Part of the reason for Spectre taking some time to read that out is um, so that uh, you've got a chance to find that, but also to give um, our illustrious panel a chance to warm up and begin to think about the things they'll want to share with us today. So I'd like to introduce the panel. First, Pete Podikar, um, Director General, Ministry of Public Administration in Slovenia. Mary Wiley-Smith, the Deputy Commissioner of the Australian Public Service Commission. And I know Mary's at the other end of the day. I'm waking up. Um, she's ending her day. Mary Nair Sullivan, Director General, Institute of Public Administration in Ireland. And Rosa Pavanelli, um, the General Secretary of the Public Services International, which represents the public sector labour unions. I'm going to kick off, um, if I may, by putting um, a, a, an opening um, set of questions to our panellists to get us going. And, and I'll probably run through just to, I, I won't mix it up too much so that you're all aware, um, panel members, um, uh, uh, around these questions. You can make sure I don't trip up as well. But um, so that we get some time for questions at the end, and I think you know this, I'll probably try and keep you to time. So watch out for a signal from me to, um, to move on so that we can get um, the full range of contributions from you all. So the first thing I'm really interested in, and I'll start with you, Pete, how has the crisis shifted our understanding of the public service and public employment? 
what have we learned? And if you can say one thing about a lesson that should be learned or applied in future. Good morning. For me, anyway. <laughs> well, good morning um, to you all. Thanks for uh, being inviting me to be this uh, member of such a distinguished uh, panelist. I think that uh, what can, we have learned in this uh, for the public employment is that public administration can be agile and responsive. And uh, in case for Slovenia, I can say that uh, it's worth mentioning two things. It's about the reputation of civil service and also about the stereotypes. When it comes to reputation of civil service, in Slovenia, it increased a lot because the civil service was the one that provided measures, several anti-corona law packages in really short time and provided the functioning of not only the critical infrastructures, but also the measures that help the economy sector. Uh, on the other hand, the uh, civil service broke down the stereotype of being uh, rigid, uh, not capable of adapting quick to the new situation. Actually, practically overnight, the civil service in Slovenia shifted to remote work. Uh, almost 70% of civil service in Slovenia worked from home. And it was something unimaginable, like a month before the start of uh, the crisis. And uh, actually, uh, interesting, when we did our poll, our little research among civil service in Slovenia, uh, over half of civil servants found their engagement, efficiency, and satisfaction uh, were even higher while uh, teleworking than uh, usually. So we upgraded uh, very quickly to use of digital skills. Uh, for new ways of communication, video meetings and conferences, dis distance trainings. What we have learned uh, is that with new forms of work, we can not only provide services, we can not only be the civil service, but we can also be more uh, efficient, uh, more resilient. And what we have uh, learned is that we should never get go back to the way it was before the corona crisis. That's for the beginning. Thank you, Peter. Um, Mary, same, same question. Um, I can repeat it if needed, but. No, look, thank you very much, Simon. And um, hello, everybody. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join you today. So uh, look, for me, I'd say the Australian, um, the Australian experience of 2020 um, was probably a little bit different to most countries because we had a couple of crises that we had to deal with. It wasn't just the pandemic um, because of course we actually started with the bushfires, um, which was just a disaster for um, quite a lot of our, our country. And we're still recovering from that. So the public service in Australia has had to actually deal with still doing the, the, the kind of recovery of, um, of what's happened with the natural disaster, as well as dealing with the pandemic. And I would say that um, for the Australian people, I think it's actually brought into pretty sharp focus the critical role that the public service plays in this country in meeting the needs of the community when they need it. And so one of the, I think, probably the, the, the critical lessons learnt is that we work better when we work together. And we've been um, working very closely as one APS throughout the crisis and we kind of rally and we know we come together in a crisis and it works quite well. Um, that we've also, um, and just kind of picking up, I think, what Peter was saying, as most governments around the world have found, um, we've found we can work remotely at scale and for some types of roles, um, they work better and productivity has actually increased. And so for us, that's probably one of the biggest lessons that we need to think about in terms of the future of the public service and, and how we operate, um, because it actually opens up new markets for us in terms of the types of people that could work with us that don't have to actually be in a particular location. And, um, and for us, um, it also, you know, there's lots of benefits for it in terms of um, our staff and their wellbeing and getting that balance right will be something that we'll be looking, uh, looking for in the future. So there you go, um, even under three minutes, Simon. Thank you, it's a sign of, uh, uh, see if we can manage that all the way through, but thank you, Mary, some interesting insights, particular insights um, from Australia there. Marion, I know it's good morning for you. Yes, it's it's definitely good morning from, from Dublin. So I would echo a lot of what the previous speakers have said. And I think in Ireland, when we had to you know, respond our, in terms of our lockdown on the 27th of March, um, there certainly has been a heightened awareness of the importance 
of public services and public administration. Um, we've seen a huge increase in cross collaboration between agencies, government departments, voluntary groups in order to support and enable those, you know, in our vulnerable communities. Um, the other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, we've certainly seen, um, you know, a group of workers who are flexible, adaptive and innovative. And I think we need to remember, you know, it doesn't matter how good your processes and structures are, it's down to having good people and people that are competent and capable of delivering. I mean, if I was to ask, you know, what are the lessons learned? Um, I think it's really important that we have a balance of specialists and generalists working in our public service. Um, we also need, and we've seen a huge growth in the whole area of distributed leadership. And we need to support those in middle management and train them up. And going back to Mary's point, you know, one of the things we will probably see changes in is the whole recruitment, retention and development of our future workforce and how do we manage that. So Simon, I mean, we have examples and I'd be quite happy to share them online as an organization. We've written up some case studies working with our local authorities, for example, how did local groups come together in the local authorities to support those and set up community initiatives um, and what the lessons learned from that was we have incredible coordinators and leaders already in our workforce and we need to give them the opportunity to, de to develop further. So I think I'm under, under three minutes. Thank you, Marin. I've clearly already um, uh, managed to persuade you all to kind of fear the time and the clock. Um, so, but thank you. Um, just getting those opening remarks um, nice and concise and get people's thinking is really great. Um, I know, Marion, um, that those of us working in PEM would be very, very uh, keen to see those case studies and examples. And I hope that you'll be able to share um, with with us and other, others there particularly. Rosa, hello. Um, hello. Good same morning. question. Uh, hi to everyone. So uh, we uh, is the, le the lessons that uh, we learned uh, from this experience. First of all, I think that we need to highlight the fact that uh, people understood uh, that uh, public employees are not only bureaucrats uh, defending their privileges, but that they are workers essential to our communities and to our societies. That was uh, really made uh, really clear in the demands uh, uh, from people, from citizens, but also from business and from uh, the economy, how relevant, how important uh, to support communities public services are. The second uh, uh, lesson we learned is that uh, uh, Public employees are not rigid. They are very much flexible and they are very much skilled as they have been able to change the way they work, to uh, use their skills, their knowledge, often without a, a, an adequate training uh, to address the emergency. And uh, um, the third lesson is that uh, uh, many of them had uh, to face uh, difficult times, uh, uh, sometimes because working in presence, uh, they had to face uh, the pressure of uh, users and the public. On the other hand, when they work from home, they had to face uh, uh, a change, a deep change in the way they work without uh, the adequate equipments, without uh, the adequate regulation of their uh, working conditions. We saw uh, in some countries, uh, collective bargaining has been able to respond to these conditions, but in many cases, this remains an issue to address. And I think this can be something we can discuss in the OECD as well for the future. Thank you. Brilliant. 
Um, you've all done an amazing job of giving me um, um, really concise uh, and tight responses. But the, there's two things that came out really strongly for me in in, in the answers there, um, just to, and just to, to hold on to um, particularly. Um, so Peter talked about reputation, and our other speakers did too. The role that and the difference in which our societies see the role of the public sector and the importance of that in there. And then a massively strong theme about um, cross-agency, cross-team, collaboration and working together. And, and, and that always strikes me as a strange reflection, given we would expect that in, in our lived day-to-day -day experience, we work closely with teams. But I think that what many of us know is that it is so very hard for our large organisations um, with their own priorities to collaborate together. I've always been a strong believer that crisis is no uh, is the is the best friend of collaboration. Um, and um, and and the key for me is as we think about this, just reflecting on on the early lessons that you just all touched on, is how we take that way of working into um, our new normal, new abnormal, business as usual, whatever you you want to call it. But I'd like to hear a bit more from the panelists. So I'm going to. Um, come to the second um, uh, area of questions I'd like to, to, to work through. So um, how can we further develop resilience in our public workforces? What will be the skills and management practices that we need um, to address? Um, I'm going to stick to the same order because that way no one will get tripped up. I was tempted to ju jump it around a bit, but that's really um, going to catch everyone out, especially me at this time in the morning. So Peter, can I ask you to kick off with that one? Thanks. Yes. Um, well, uh, actually, the resilience, uh, we, it can be developed with, uh, of course, on one hand, with uh, efficient use of digital uh, technologies in the public sector, that's for sure. But uh, my idea is also that the civil service should become a learning organization. I mean, it's not only about the tools, the infrastructure, we should invest in uh, people uh, and their places and their uh, skills. And the crisis has, sh has shown us that. Uh, with becoming the, I mean, the one thing is for sure, digital technologies will radically change the way public administration works. And if we were like a couple of years ago, we were talking about the future of work in public service now, service now we are living it. So uh, actually uh, there will be, much more interconnected organization, virtual teams, technology supported workplaces, uh, etc. But for that, we should not only invest in technology, but also and even more in people and the places they work. So with becoming the learning organization, uh, these skills needs to keep pace with new technologies and complex society uh, problem. The new skills will be uh, more important. It's about the critical thinking, creativity, judgment, responsive, innovation and everything. But the, the most important skill for the future of public employment will be ability to continuously learn and adapt. And it's not just a phrase. It was really interesting in our poll that we did in Slovenia, the uh, elder, the elder civil servant uh, responded, they found the telework less efficient for them. And the younger, they said that they were more efficient when they were teleworking. So we need to find the way also not between the, uh, the cooperation, not only between the organization, but also the intergenerational cooperation in the civil service. The civil service are aging. We don't want anyone to uh, be left behind because of lack of uh, digital skills. Uh, because, you know, as once I said, like, uh, like an old African proverb says, uh, the youth can walk faster, but the elder knows the road. So uh, we should promote uh, coaching uh, membership. So uh, this will with becoming learning organization. I think uh, the public service can become an attractive employer for young talents with the right mix of skills, but also for our uh, elder uh, colleagues. So it's one thing that needs to be emphasized, intergenerational cooperation within uh, the public service. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. I'm, I'm left wondering whether I'm a younger worker or an older worker, but I think all those years spent um, on digital platforms like Twitter and um, Facebook has put me in a good, good in a good position to, to, to continuously learn really um, fabulous points there. Maybe not so much new skills, but carrying them, carrying them through. 
Um, Mary, let's hear from you, thanks. Yeah, look, thanks very much, Simon. And um, I'm probably an older worker, I think, um, listening to that, but you never know. Um, I Look, I've got notes here that I just want to just kind of talk through, but I just really, my, my points align with Peter's. Um, we've been undertaking a lot of reform over the previous years, um, looking at what kind of civil service or public service do we need for the future. Um, and there was a lot of there was a lot of talk in there about how we actually build the skills we need for the future, particularly in managers and leaders. And so we were very focused on that. And it was all around actually getting people with um, learning agility and really good emotional intelligence into the service who can help manage and lead their people through change and who can do, we, we know that change is just inevitable and that the soft skills or so-called so soft skills is something that we really need to focus on. Um, as a service, I think we've probably valued analytical ability um, over probably the soft skills in the past. And I think that there's a growing realization that for the future, we need to be able to influence, communicate, bring our people with us. And so what we've seen through COVID is all of the reforms that we were doing has actually accelerated um, the reform. And basically we can see that we actually need managers that can manage through change and uncertainty, um, the importance of emotional intelligence and good judgment to solve problems and to be able to collaborate with one another to actually find solutions very quickly. Um, and just basically the learning agility, going back to what Peter was just saying, learn, innovate, people that can experiment with new approaches. Um, and I think, I think all of that is actually something that we're grappling with at the moment because we really need to look at what we're recruiting, how we're building capability and how we're bringing people through. Um, I also agree with Peter that I think our experience over the last year has demonstrated the importance of staff having kind of solid foundational skills in digital and data. Um, and so that's going to be a focus for us going forward. And um, we've actually just gone with um, something that the UK did many years ago and starting to build professional streams. And at the moment, it's human resources and, and having strategic HR to help manage the change and build capability within the service and be those trusted advisors and data and digital. So they're the three that we're really focused on at the moment. Um, and uh, I think, you know, for us, they're the, probably the key things um, as well as kind of getting that blend right with the remote working. Um, because I think what we've seen is um, it's actually working pretty well. Our WHS or kind of the you know, how the workforce is going, their health issues, their mental health. We've actually been able to manage that pretty well through COVID. And we think a balance of working from home and working in the office is probably something we really need to explore as the new norm going forward. So I'll stop there. Um, but very similar things to what Peter just said. Thanks, Simon. Thank you, Mary. Marion, you next. Okay, thank you. I mean, I, I would echo what the other speakers have said. And in Ireland, we had been going through quite a significant reform program. And I just put down some of my thoughts. One thing I've seen, and particularly as we are a training and education organization, you know, where did we see an increase in demands for training? What were our customers looking for? Um, and my thoughts are around, you know, distributed leadership. How do we now build our middle management teams? Um, and the other thing is going back to, you know, public sector values and mindsets. And what is the mindsets of individuals working in our public administration motivation? Like a lot of other countries, we are looking at the balance and growing our specialists, for example, HR, project management, one of the big issues that's facing us, the whole area of cybersecurity and, and data and training up those specialists. One of my thoughts is, and I think Mary, you alluded to it in terms of our leaders and the soft skills and having more visible leaders and looking around mental well-being and wellness. Um, I work with a lot of the semi-state agencies and as CEOs, we meet virtually on a monthly basis. And we have a huge concern about the wellness and mental support for our workers because 
most of us, often we don't know what's going on in their lives. They're juggling working at home. They're juggling looking after elderly parents. And often it's the fear of the unknown. How long will this, you know, go on for? Uh, as somebody said, this is the new normal. And how do we support our own workers? And that then brings you back to, you know, communities of practice. How do we learn from each other? And in the um, Irish context, we have working groups or groups collaborating across project management from government departments and agencies sharing the expertise. The other question I would ask is around risk. I mean, often it's seen that, you know, civil servants and public servants are risk adverse and how, you know, managing the risk appetite of organizations and being able to respond very, very quickly. And I think we've all shown that we can do that. Um, so, you know, there, there's a number of thoughts there, but, but if I was to take two messages is communities of practice and maybe we'll, we'll see new roles in terms of, if I call it often in the private sector, you know, people, people or people, um, you know, managers in the sense that looking after the wellness, the well-being and coaching our staff. So thank you. Thanks, Marion. Rosa. Yeah, thank you. Uh, well, I think that uh, further developing resilience means, first of all, uh, the political will to invest in public services and uh, in public administration. Decades of cuts in public spending, in understaffing, in freezing the turnover has uh, uh, failed. And we saw the impact of those policies exactly during the pandemic. So the first thing to address is this one. The second one is the fact that emergencies cannot be used as a political tool for competitions among political parties or different level of governments and institutions. Unfortunately, we have witnessed that and it impacted on the effectiveness of uh, uh, workers and public administration to function uh, as uh, in several cases in many countries, conflict between federal state, national states, regions, local government and central government have been at the center of the, pol of the political polemics uh, during these months. And this is something to avoid. And then there is the issue of uh, training workers and providing workers all the uh, tools uh, and uh, the skills that they need. Uh, public administration discovered uh, in a broad sense uh, digitalization and high tech, high tech uh, during this pandemic. I think this is something that we need uh, to acknowledge and to further strengthen and develop uh, and develop the skills that we need in the public administration to do that. I just want to make a comment on what has been said that uh, teleworking, I think is an experience that we need to continue and we need to continue probably as uh, Mary said, in a balance between working presence and uh, uh, teleworking. But it also requires um, the evaluation of the different situations. I can understand why young workers reacting better Maybe they're single, maybe they have no family, maybe they didn't find themselves with a bunch of children having to get their lessons uh, on, uh, on internet. Uh, mm, and also the physical conditions are different. We cannot be sure that all the workers who were forced to do teleworking, to work from home, have enough physical space to organize their own small office at home. And there's another issue. Uh, we saw in many countries the disproportionate impact that teleworking had on women. 
and uh, because of uh, the uh, burden of uh, care for the family and the work together without uh, a precise regulation. And last but not least, the fact that in many countries we saw a dramatic drop in exposing domestic violence. And uh, this shows that if there are no shelters, if there are no services, if women are obliged to stay home, they more easily become victims of domestic violence. And all these are issues that our governments have to fix. But first and foremost, I think that we need the political will to learn from this experience and change the approach that we had in the past decades. Rosa, thank you. Um, some great contributions there from, from, from everyone around the area of re uh, resilience. Um, it's very striking if you take one thing that we've all got used to, um, had to get used to in relation to, or most of us in relation to how we've, how we've worked over the course of the past months and this this feature of working um, away from the office. I know that not everyone in the public service has been able to do that, but many, 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 many people have, pro probably the majority. Um, and as Rosa was just talking about, how we make sure that that as a way of working um, is fair and proportionate and um, isn't just something more senior people can do um, or people who perhaps um, have um, uh, um, you know, different domestic circumstances. So we've, we've really got, I think, if we're going to be resilient in terms of going forwards to work out how this is. Um, and of course, within that, people will have had the experience of working from home. And I'm sure, um, not, although not for everybody, that work-life balance being different and all the challenges it brings is something that we're going to have to um, try and make some decisions about um, uh, in the way that we're going forward because people's expectations will have changed. But um, what that conversation really brought out for me is that for every person that, um, for example, enjoys working from home and more freedom, there's someone that doesn't or someone for whom that's difficulties in doing that or someone for whom we don't yet have the skills around that. So um, it's not a simple question, is it? And it will be a different answer um, for different people. Um, just a quick encouragement from me that if you want to, you still have the opportunity, I believe, um, to go on the poll. Um, I just mentioned that the, I'll come back to the results in a moment, but they're looking optimistic. Um, the, the one highlight I will give you is no one thinks nothing is going to change, which is not a surprise <laughs> unless they've actually been asleep for the last nine months. Um, which is unlikely, I think, in in these in the in the in these strange times. So the final um, uh, kind of opening question, if you like, opening round of questions, I just wanted to take to our panelists was really what are the opportunities for rethinking public employment when this crisis is behind us? What risks will need to be managed, and what pitfalls will we have to avoid? Um, and I will stick to the I will stick to the pattern I have been. So Peter, to you first. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Simon. I will uh, continue when, uh, where Rosa uh, ended because it's really important what she said that uh, about the, what are the risk. Uh, the risk are uh, how to achieve uh, for civil servants the work-life balance. You know, this is uh, really important. Uh, we have advantages, we have opportunities of uh, remote work, but there are also the risk. Uh, you know, all about the situation. But uh, the opportunities are, uh, we should definitely not go back to how the situation about the remote work was before the crisis. Uh, I think that uh, all, besides all the risk, uh, all the dangerous uh, situation that were mentioned, I think that uh, the remote work still proved to be very, uh, can be very efficient for the civil service. But what we should do is we should design a job policy in a way that makes the most of remote work and work uh, in the office. So we should uh, define what tests can be better performed from the office what are the advantages of uh, the remote uh, work? Uh, for successful telework, I think we should uh, especially help civil servants achieve uh, work-life balance, it was mentioned. It, we should prevent 
burnout. I see some situations here also at our ministry, people who are taking care of small children at home because in Slovenia, there's also schools are uh, in lockdown. So people are working from home, they're educating, taking care of their children and it's really like uh, challenging for them. But uh, I think that what we should do, and it's a case for Slovenia, and I'm, I wonder whether it is the same in other member states, uh, we should change the culture uh, of management of leaders uh, regarding the telework. Uh, they should build trust in their uh, employees. They should motivate them to keep on working efficiently in these challenging conditions. And why there are challenging conditions, uh, I like to compare the teleworking from the spring first wave and now uh, when it's the second wave. In the first wave, the situation was slightly different. People find it something new and they know that it eventually it will end in a month or so. But now we are hit by the second wave and people are afraid of how long does it, is it going to last, you know? They miss their social component of uh, working uh, in the office. So it's becoming uh, challenging for all of us. And this is, in this time of in such challenges, I think uh, we should put, uh, we should put some, uh, it's, it's really important how the civil service uh, leaders perform. Uh, and in the future, more emphasis should be put on crisis management skills of civil service uh, leaders. Now it's really important uh, what kind of leaders do we have in civil service? Are they obsessed with the reports or they are, uh, they, they have this touch for uh, people, you know, how to organize them, how to communicate with them. It has never been more important in civil service for civil service leaders, uh, how to, uh, the importance of communications uh, with your team who are teleworking, provide them with the sufficient information, provide them uh, with, so they will still feel that they are part of the situation. So, um, I think that uh, in the future, uh, we should avoid the risk of uh, forget about uh, civil servants, uh, their uh, work-life balance. Uh, we should uh, put uh, more uh, emphasis on the crisis management skills. And uh, it's all about the, uh, the importance of proper uh, leadership uh, became even more important than it was. So it's about the putting the right people in the right places. That's the motto. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. And um, I always uh, enjoy these sessions when they point back to leadership because I know for the, for o OECD this means uh, more work and, uh, and and ideas coming into the PEM. So. Um, uh, a lot of it boils down to leaders, so welcome to, to hear those comments. Thank you, uh, Peter. Mary. Yeah, thanks, Simon. Um, so look, we think that, you know, there's lots of opportunities um, at the moment um, to rethink public employment and what we've seen right around the world with people being able to work remotely at scale. Um, and also mobility is a big issue for us. And I don't know where, I'm sure it is in other um, countries as well. Um, part of the challenge for it is that we've got a very tired workforce. Um, we've got a lot of people that have been working long hours. And as I said, we've had bushfires in 2020 as well as, as coronavirus. And so it's basically what's the tolerance and, um, and we need to look after their well-being. But at the same time, we know we want to make changes and actually make some changes to our governance arrangements, which kind of embed some of the ways of working that we've seen. And for us, this is particularly around one APS. And so what we would call one kind of service. We're set up as lots of different types of departments and agencies kind of very separately run um, with kind of what we would like CEOs that manage kind of each, each department. And for us, the crisis has really brought us all together. And so there's a lot of will in the senior executives um, for us to actually continue this and to work together more effectively and it would be more efficient use of resources for the for the taxpayers so we're quite keen on it um, two areas I'll briefly mention to you because this cuts across um, everything from how we structure ourselves um, all the way through to you know what kind of leaders we hire but there are two things that I just wanted to mention one of them relates to what we've just heard from Peter and also from, from Rosa around what we do with our workforce and where they work into the future. And I think for us, 
you know, how I said that I think we need a bit of balance. Um, one of the things that we are looking at for the future is whether we can actually have what we call public service hubs closer to where people live. And so if you work in a particular department, but you have to go into the CBD of a city um, and it takes you an hour and a half to get in there and an hour and a half back, perhaps you don't need to do that. Perhaps you could work in a hub with public servants from a whole heap of other agencies. So you're still getting that connection but you don't necessarily need to five days a week go into the into the your own agency within the CBD. So we're exploring that um, and, and thinking about what we might be able to do in, in that type of space. The other area that we've been very focused on is public service um, mobility. And so what we did very early on in the crisis is work out who was actually in critical roles that we needed to support what we were doing um, to support the community and the government during COVID. Those areas um, and functions that were found not to actually be needed, um, they're not the same priority at this point in time. We mobilised that workforce to actually go and help out where it was really busy. And it's been a really positive um, journey for most people that were involved. A lot of our younger kind of graduates coming into the service actually took part. And instead of joining an agency, if we were to talk to them, they would say, we joined the Australian Public Service and they have a different view and they're willing, most of them, I think it's about 60 or 70% said they would actually volunteer to do something like that again. So what we've wanted to do is to take the opportunity and to think about this for the future. So when there is a future crisis that we actually have a, a workforce that's a cert, what we call a surge reserve, and they've already actually nominated to be part of that reserve. We already know what skill sets they have. And going back to what Peter said at the very end of his, his discussion is it will enable us to get the right people in the right places at the time we need them. And instead of actually spending, you know, a week or two trying to work out who we've got in different agencies that could actually surge in to help. So we're working on that now um, and we look forward to kind of building that with agencies, but we'll embed that in how the public service at the federal level works into the future. And we've also agreed that, that reserve can also surge into our state agencies when they need us. And that's actually happened during this pandemic as well. We've helped out a couple of what we call our state governments. So there's two things um, that we're kind of focused on. And I just think the opportunity for reform is now because we actually have that leadership that's actually joined up and thinking about it. So it's an opportunity too good to, to not take. But the challenge is we need to look after our workforce and they've worked really hard and we don't want to actually, um, we don't want to impact them adversely through extra change with everything that they've done. So thanks, Simon. Thanks, Mary. Two things there that interest me and that we've been um, exploring for some time, actually, um, just within our own organisation, um, um, together with other government departments, trying to create hubs in cities um, that will begin to... And I think, uh, though that work has been talked about for some time, this does produ pro provide an opportunity for a reality around that because the behaviour of how we um, will end up operating. And then the surge thing is something else we've been kind of exploring um the kind of a almost a national resilience force within our civil service where you've where you've got so, so both really really interesting ideas marion okay um one of the things i would think we also need to consider is as I, and i've made a comment about the balance between specialists and generalists and it's important that we grow a professional workforce in certain areas but it's equally important that we have those leaders who have what we call wise counsel and do the interface between the political and the administrative structures. There certainly will be demands and requirements for new skills in the whole area of cyber security, uh, governance, managing risk, um, supporting coaching and wellness. And maybe looking at Ireland at the moment, our um, civil service is looking at a policy, sorry, it's working on a policy for remote working and we'll be consulting the unions. And our Minister for um, Rural Affairs recently announced that there will be more working hubs for public servants. They're going to be rolled out across rural Ireland and looking at using, you know, state owned properties where um, public and civil servants can work together. 
I suppose one of the things I would like to comment on is, you know, unintended consequences for those that are working remotely. And I think we need to look at those. I mean, working remotely has both advantages and disadvantages. But one of the questions that's been raised in Ireland, particularly from the business world, for women and from other groups, you know, will it be seen as a disadvantage that you're working from home? It's almost like out of, you know, out of sight, out, out of mind. Um, in terms of promotion, those who are not in the building, are they visible? How do we make our remote working uh, population visible? How do we support those informal networks? The conversation that happens at the coffee table where you've two parts of an organization coming together, an idea sparks. Because sometimes some of the conversations online you know, we go online, we have so many Zoom calls, we do the business, but we don't do the chat. And sometimes it's the chat, for example, like yourself, Satri Marin, I mentioned a report, can you send that on to me? And those are the things we need, we need to look out for. Um, unconscious bias, um, will we return to almost a re-traditionalization of roles? Uh, we don't want that to happen. None of us are going back to where we are. We're moving forward, but we need to ask those questions as leaders. So if I was looking at in terms of future training, particularly for leaders, it's very much being adaptable, being agile and being visible and being able to manage you know, uh, risk and support cross collaboration among different state agencies. And also, the, we mustn't forget the business world and our communities, that it's not just public administrators working on their own, it's a whole community. And we've seen that particularly in Ireland, we ran our innovation week recently and the interface between the, if I call it the industry business world and public administration and what we can learn from each other. So thank you. Thanks, Mary. Marion. Finally, Rosa. Yeah, thank you. Well, just um, uh, a few short comments on the polls. The first thing I would like to say is that I'm very happy that only 14% of uh, the responders uh, uh, suggested that austerity, workforce reaction and pay cuts can be uh, the recipe for the future. This is exactly what we need to avoid because these are the mistakes that uh, brought us here. The second is uh, that uh, uh, when we talk about flexibility, I would like to talk about flexibilities in terms of skills, in terms of capacity to um, uh, adapting the organization, the work, uh, the competencies around uh, the real needs of the community and the society, rather than flexibility of the employment contracts. Uh, which has been one of the mantra of the past decades. Um, uh, what uh, we uh, can do uh, for in um, uh, to to avoid uh, risk and rethinking uh, the employment, uh, uh, I think first of all we need to be ready to have. Uh, uh, a response uh, in uh, short uh, terms, uh, but with uh, a long distant vision. Uh, I hope we will not have to face another uh, pandemic uh, in a few months, but we know that the climate uh, crisis is there. The social crisis that will follow uh, the pandemic is there. We already see uh, the evidence in many areas. And public administration has to be prepared to face all these multifaceted threats and risks. And this requires the capacity to, uh, uh, to, to select the staff 
with the right competencies, with the select management and leaders that understand uh, their role and uh, that uh, are able to uh, connect more and more uh, the different level of our democratic institutions and uh, of governments uh, in order to be more effective. I think this is important and it's not just a matter of workers, it's a matter of the ideas that we have of the public administration. Can we continue to think that public administration is just a cost, a burden on public budgets, a burden that is increasing public debt? I think that we need to change the narrative if we want to stimulate a different approach from citizens, from public opinion to the public administration. We need a social recognition for public service workers, but also for uh, the importance, the role of public administration, of government. If one thing uh, is... Uh, mm, uh, I, I think one of the major uh, problem we had to face in the past is the loss of credibility of government. And this is something uh, that we need to address. Public employees can support can help in that direction, but we need a frame. We need a, a, a you know, a, a, a collective approach in that direction that can help uh, to readdress uh, the situation. I think workers are ready to take uh, the challenge uh, to, to, um, to um, start working in different ways. But this, as you all have said, uh, requires also the fact uh, that uh, uh, working conditions, uh, even if, either if they are uh, exert in presence or uh, on teleworking, had to, to be addressed and they had to be have to be uh, regulated. Uh, and to such extent, uh, there's a precondition: the fact that workers can organize and form the union. And this is not the case everywhere, as in many countries, uh, public service workers are prevented to organize to form a union and are prevented to have collective bargaining. We saw during the pandemic that collective bargaining can really be a tool to address problem, to solve problems and to make it easier the life for workers and the life and the mission of public uh, administration. Thank you. Um, thank you, Rosa. Um, well, I just wanted to um, thank the panellists for their um, thoughts and comments, um, ideas so far. Um, just to turn it around a bit, what we've had uh, through the poll is an opportunity to hear from you um, all about uh, what your answer to our question was, and that's whether the median term impacts um, what the median term impact, sorry, of coronavirus will be on public employment. Um, about half of you, nearly dead on half of you, think it will lead to a more flexible and resilient um, model of uh, public sector employment. Um, and 40% of you, I think, are um, very strongly of the view that that will need to be a more digitally savvy public sector workforce. Um, as Rosa was just commenting, um, Thankfully, few um, see new rounds of austerity, but that will be something that probably won't be in our control or be in the control of our um, political leaders. Um, I think there's, some per there's, there's just one person, I think, that thinks that maybe um, things will have little impact and they'll return to where they are. But I just wanted to invite the panellists. Um, I won't come to all of you, but... Um, would anyone like to offer a kind of reflection on there? Um, probably not surprising in terms of the results and comforting that we're very clear that there are some opportunities for a better employment model and better capability, particularly in the digital space. But 
Um, I just wanted to get, just in terms of managing time, offer a couple of you um, an opportunity to reflect on that. So um, it'll probably be uh, either put your hand up or um, Pete, you've come off. Uh, Peter, you've come off mute. So go ahead. Okay. Um, actually, uh, the the poll is not uh, surprising, but I'm happy about the poll because the worst thing would be that. Uh, the poll would uh, provide us with the information that the reflection is that uh, nothing will change. <laughs> that would be the worst case. I hope uh, it will never be the same as it was before the crisis. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that the majority voted for the future about uh, public sector being uh, more flexible, more uh, re resilient. But uh, in order to achieve that, uh, there's a lot of work uh, to be done in the future uh, and actually uh, we should uh, we should in we should uh, maybe more uh, make more reflection on performance, uh, engage employees, uh, civil service leaders should lead uh, with the vision, and we should also promote the values of public service. Uh, in thinking this uh, crisis, it's shown that the values of public service uh, are really uh, important. Uh, I think that. Uh, public uh, employees in the time of crisis uh, showed up in some areas to be uh, heroes in the crisis. And uh, we should, they managed to keep the public systems functioning uh, all the way. So I'm happy about the result. I think that uh, more flexible and resilient model of public sector is definitely the future, but we need to continue working on that. Maybe that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Any additional reflections from um, any of Mary, Marion or Rosa, just on what they see in the poll? Um, maybe I might Mary. come in. I think, you know, my comment on the poll is that to enable to have a very flexible and resilient model of public sector employment, we will need a more digitally savvy public sector workforce and they actually balance each other out and how do we enable our staff, you know, to work in a digital environment to, you know, support our citizens, but at the same time, when we're looking at performance management and trust, that we have all those values. So that's Thanks. Next. Thanks, Mary. I'm going to I'm going to move if I can to some of the questions that you've been asking as well, and um, and I'm going to put. I'm going to pick the two because we're mindful of time and we want to get through um, and just get one final closing comment from from panelists as well. Um, I'm just going to ask um, uh, a couple of questions to the to the panel that reflect the things that you've been um, asking us. Um, so uh, the first question I really want to um, share, and I'll put this to um, to uh, Rosa and um, uh, and to uh, Marion, um, are what will happen to the parts of the civil service workforce unrelated to age that don't match the requirements of the future workforce? So, what's your take on that? Um, um, should we start with Rosa? Well, I hope you don't me, want me to say that we need uh, to call for redundancy. Or <laughs> of course that's not. That's not my job. <laughs> that's not my job. Of course not. Of course not. Well, uh, I think that uh, there's an objective problem in many countries. I, I mean, I just, for instance, just looking to my country, the country where I come from, Italy. Well, the average age of uh, public administration employees is quite high. It's quite high. And this is the result of uh, the turnover freezing of many years. Uh, it, this also means the fact that you will have less, uh, let's say, adaptable workers, uh, particularly when we talk about uh, digital uh, knowledge uh, and, uh, and skills. Uh, so I think that uh, uh, this is something that has uh, to be considered and uh, um, public administration has to accompany this process uh, towards uh, uh, um, refreshing, I would say, 
uh, its, uh, its staff, uh, its uh, employees. Uh, and this is uh, for sure something that has to be done. But at the same time, we saw that without specific training, particular training, many of our uh, workers and employees uh, took on the challenge of uh, teleworking, of dealing with uh, complex uh, processes and procedures working from remote. Uh, this means that when there is the urgency, the necessity, and also the understanding to contribute to a broader cause, to a common cause, to serve the mission of the public administration, people understand and people uh, uh, are ready uh, to learn and are ready to change uh, their habits, their habits. Uh, we need to insist on that. And uh, I think that uh, this uh, accompanied with uh, the support of uh, the organization, the public administration, uh, in, in uh, enhancing uh, the social role, the social recognition of uh, public service workers, public administration is something that can help to renew at large and uh, in a comprehensive way, the role of our administrations. Also considering that public administration are crucial to strengthen our democratic institution. And we saw how much they are undermined right now because of these tensions that are multiplying uh, for the social instabilities that many have to face. Thank you, Rosa, thank you. And Marion, some brief thoughts from you on that question. Okay, can you hear me? Okay. Very, very briefly, um, one of the things I think we, we need to look at is, and I agree with Rosa, our public servants have been extremely adaptable, but there have been challenges. And what I've seen is, you know, I've seen an increase in people looking, you know, they're coming towards retirement instead of retiring after 40 years. They want to retire after 38 years. Um, I do see maybe in the future, because jobs are going to change and roles and responsibilities are going to, role, to change, will we see demands in terms of increased salaries or, you know, it's a new, new uh, job uh, spec I also see for those who are not able to adapt, and I agree with Rosa um, in terms of reskilling, and are there other opportunities in terms of moving to other roles? And I think we need to be very mindful of that. You know, there are some jobs that may become redundant, but at the same time, we have a staff and a workforce with you know skills that they were able to use and we were able to call on to support our communities. So I think we need to look very, very carefully at the future roles that we will need if there are any other crises or critical incidences. So I would support a lot of what um, Rosa has said. You know, we've asked the question and I've brought this, you know, are we going to have future redundancies? At the moment, we're not looking at that. We're looking at how we can support and enable our current workforce to adapt to the crisis and working very closely with them, what are the skills they require in the future to deliver their jobs. Thank you, Marion. And our other question that I want to put at this time to Peter and Mary is, has the crisis accelerated a more joined up collaborative public service um, even for business as usual? And how will we keep the collaboration going when the crisis is behind us? And I know in your answers to other questions, you both picked up that collaboration point. So um, I'll go to Mary first this time. 
Thanks, Simon. Um, look, I actually think there's two, that the answer is is yes, um, because it has. Um, we're talking a lot more together. Um, systems have been set up. Um, we've got working groups, kind of committees to deal with particular issues. So what you're seeing is public servants um, across um, you know, the public service all coming together and working together and building relationships. So I think the, the response to how you embed it into the future, I think there are two things to consider. One is kind of um, normalising it. And so you want to probably set in, in train whatever governance, governance arrangements would enable that to occur. And then the other issue is around your culture and actually ensuring that collaboration and engagement with your peers, with others, is just expected from you. So making sure that the incentives in the system are aligned with what you want to see in terms of that collaboration going forward. And so for us, um, I can give you an example. We are thinking about it here, about um, what we expect of our senior executives and um, that collaboration is something that's key and talking to their peers to see what they, they think of that person's collaboration and building it into the performance, the expectations, um, and going forward. And I think I think ensuring that there are opportunities for relationships to continue as well that have been built. But I think, you know, governance and the second one really is the getting the culture, those expectations right. Okay. So thanks. It's that little problem of culture that we need to fix. But um, yeah. uh, well, maybe start with that. behaviors. We'll start with behaviors <laughs> and find a line and make sure they're right. But no, good point. <laughs> yeah, that, that, uh, unfair point on my point on, on my part. And we have this, this is a great opportunity to address that. Um, let's hear briefly from you, uh, Peter. Thank you. Uh, yes, really briefly, because uh, for the first time in this panel, I have a chance to lean on what Mary uh, said, uh, actually. Um, actually, uh, it's yes, uh, the collaboration uh, was really successful during this uh, crisis. It was collaboration uh, between in short time activities, short time measures. So the only lesson that we need to learn, why can we not put this collaboration that we used in these short-term activities, short-term measures, to the long-term vision. It's, it can be done. It's a good experience, but it all comes to uh, strategic orientation uh, goals of our public uh, administration. So uh, it, it's all about the culture. It's all about the leadership. Maybe just a brief comment on the previous question that was uh, uh, commented by Marian and Rosa is, uh, actually, if uh, if somebody is lacking behind with his digital skills, I think the problem uh, began a couple of years ago when uh, this organization was not a learning organization. He didn't gain his skills, so uh, today he's facing the lack of skills, and it cannot be just the fault of public employees uh, of, of this particular civil servant. So it's our job. It's our job uh, to provide the uh, civil service to be a learning organization and the majority of workers will be uh, having uh, uh, enough digital skills. Uh, so I believe that what we have learned is that key of success uh, is only in collaboration. So thank you. Thank you. Really good points. And I think that's something we'd all um, share and agree. Um, one final question to each of you, and I'm asking you to keep, keep, keep this to a very brief point. Um, um, it's a question that we're asking every panellist and contributor to government aftershock and will actually be used to help us um, crystallise the call for action that I talked about at the beginning of the meeting. So I'm going to go through in my usual order um, and ask you each to give me um, um, a very quick answer to what you personally are committed to doing differently in light of what has been revealed by the crisis. So. Um, Hopefully that should be something that comes quickly to mind. But um, let's start with you, Peter. Um, well, what I have learned is that uh, it's all about the people. You know, it's all about the people in civil service. It, uh, you can buy uh, an infrastructure and you can buy hardware easily, but it's all about the people. Uh, in it, uh, putting the right people into the right positions uh, have a selection process because people are really important and that requires uh, from me as a civil service uh, leader uh, working constantly with our civil servants to adapt to the crisis and get their job done uh, with performance. So I think that the 
major message, uh, main message of future of public employment is it's all about the people in civil service. Thank, thank you. you. That's tweetable, that is. Uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, Mary. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so it is, I completely agree, it's all about the people. Um, the thing that I'm really committed to at the moment, and it's quite personal, it goes back to something that we talked about at the very beginning of this session, and this is about the reputation of the public service. I think public services around the world have done a terrific job, and so I'm pretty committed to actually telling the positive stories and wanting to get that out there because it builds kind of the recognition for the service, but that reputation issue. Um, and a lot of people don't realise what's been going on in the in the in the service and what we've done to support the community. So we wanna bring that to light. And I'm gonna do a plug. We have a state of the service report um, for the Australian Federal Public Service coming out soon. It'll be tabled in our parliament and it tells the stories. Brilliant. So. Well, I look forward to reading about that. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mary. Marion. One of the things I'm looking at as a CEO of a state agency is very much focusing and ensuring that we have diversity of thought and ideas and leadership can come from places often you don't expect or you weren't aware during a crisis, identifying those and giving those an opportunity to develop in the organization. And at a personal level, I think it's really important as leaders that we also look after ourselves. We talk about resilience and I see the head nodding in the, in the panel. It's been hard and it's been tough. And many of us go into our organizations physically or virtually and we, we can be scared because it's an unknown future or it was. Now things we hope are beginning to settle. So I think it's important that we lead by example, that we're visible, and that also we look after our own physical and mental well-being. I missed my commute. That was my time for me. Now I walk downstairs after a day's work, and I've had to make the decision. I go out the front door, I go for the walk, so I feel like I'm returning home after a day's work and making that difference. So there, there are two comments. Thanks, Marion. And that's a lovely story and a, and, a, and a timely reminder that we're all affected by this and our own resilience as leaders is critical. Um, and final word there to Rosa then. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, well, um, I, I think that uh, what I personally realised is that uh, um, Instability can happen and things can happen despite your will. This is why as a public administration and the public uh, uh, civ or civil servant, uh, uh, we, we need to provide civil servant uh, all the skills and the capacity to be read, to respond, to be ready to respond uh, to these uh, instability. It happens. As Mary said, uh, Australia had to face uh, bush fires, but many, in many places, uh, along with the pandemic, people had to face uh, uh, social upravel, upravel uh, earthquake, floods, uh, typhoons, uh, hurricanes, all natural disasters possible. And this requires a strong, strong structure of public administration. Okay. And I'm very committed to work in that direction and to cooperate with all those who want to go in that direction. Thank you, Rosa. So thank you to the brilliant contributions um, from our panelists today. Thank you to Peter, to Mary, to Marion um, and to Rosa. Um, I've only got one other job. Um, which is um, to answer that question myself, I suppose. Um, but I've only got a minute left and I can't do it. So what I advise you to do is go and look at one of the brilliant podcasts. I think there are 25 at least of them related to government aftershock. And I had to answer that question on there. So um, 
Um, that will also mean you get the benefit of the rest of my opinions around um, um, all of this. So rather than um, share that there, I'm going to make a plug for those podcasts and encourage you to go and have a look at them. Um, thank you so much uh, for the way in which everyone has contributed and kept us to time. That means that we can finish on time. We need to finish on time because I know there are plenty of other sessions today that people can get to. But thank you, everyone. Have a brilliant day, whether that's the brilliant day that's behind you or a brilliant day uh, that you're just about to start. Um, it's now long enough into the day for me to feel awake. The coffee has kicked in. Have a fabulous day and thank you.